Uh, today, as Peter said, I want to give a brief overview of the economy. My outlook for the next year or so, including the path of monetary policy, and then uh, talk a little bit about a subject that is probably near and dear to your heart, student debt. Before I begin, I have to start the way we always do at the Fed with the standard pro proviso that my views today are mine alone and they do not reflect uh, the views of anyone else at the uh, Federal Open Market Committee or the Federal Reserve System. So, with that out of the way, uh, things look pretty good. Uh, we started off the year with a strong labor market. We added 227,000 jobs in January, and the unemployment rate now stands at 4.8%, which is at or below my estimate of the natural rate of unemployment. Now, that's a slight uptick from December, but it actually reflects more people uh, coming off the sidelines and back into the labor force. So in this case, it's actually a positive outcome that the unemployment rate picked up a little bit. U6 unemployment, uh, which includes marginally attached and people who are part-time but really want a full-time job and others, that stands at 9.4%. Well, it is still higher than I'd like. It's a far cry from the bad old days of the recession and its aftermath when U6 reached a peak of about 17%. Quits are still high, layoffs remain low, and job postings are near historical peaks. My business contacts continue to tell me that finding workers, especially in certain occupations, is getting more and more difficult. So taking all that into account, the labor market continues to tighten, and I see it as more or less back to full health. Now, whenever I talk about the labor market, I am always careful I have to point out that just because things are good or even healthy doesn't mean they are perfect. There continues to be pockets of the country, both geographically and demographically, that are not feeling the relief. We have a lot of them here in the Philly Fed's third district, post-industrial towns, rural areas, and the urban landscape. We need to pay special attention to the regions and demographic groups that have been left behind. The Fed can help, to some extent, through our community development work, which focuses on strengthening local economies. But for the most part, monetary policy doesn't have the scope or the tools to address these issues heads on, head on. That takes legislative action. And while I'm relatively upbeat about employment, there is still room for wage growth to move up. So let's talk about inflation, moving on to inflation. We're seeing positive upward movement, <coughs> though PCE remains below our 2% target. I should note that inflation as measured by CPI is often higher than PCE, which is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. That said, it still indicates an overall upward movement. And I see us reaching our 2% target on PCE sometime this year or next. So turning to growth. Real GDP increased 1.9% in the fourth quarter of 2016. A substantial drag from net exports slowed growth there. While real GDP growth was stronger in the second half of 2016, after it grew by 3.5% in the third quarter, we're really looking at moderate growth overall, averaging just about 2%. The Philly Fed survey of professional forecasters points to 2% growth in the current quarter. Retail sales have been strong, rising 0.4% in January. In fact, we've seen a rapid acceleration in retail sales since the middle of last year. And consumer confidence <coughs> continued the upward trend that started in 2016, carrying forward into this year. Overall, I see strong consumer spending driving growth of about 2% over the course of the year. And that 2% growth is more or less what we should consider normal for the medium term. Given the state of the economy, more or less back to normal, I continue to see three modest rate hikes of 25 basis points each as appropriate for this year, 2017, assuming things stay on track. There is no question that investing in the education of our citizens is essential for growth and is the core for our economic future. We're talking about the engine of the American economy. The men and women who will be creating the next miracle drug, inventing the next radical technological innovation, writing the next wave of 
legislation. But there's an all too familiar problem that can act as a barrier to people getting the education they need. To steal a line from John Oliver, if you went to college in America, the chances are you have two things. Bob Marley's greatest hits and student debt. The headlines you've heard before, and they're fairly staggering. The number of people with student debt doubled between 2000 and 2014, with a total of about 42 million people with student debt. Aggregate student loan debt in the United States is currently nearly $1.3 trillion. The average student loan borrower has about $31,000 in outstanding balances, whereas the typical American borrower owes over $16,000. And 11% of balances are past due, compared to 8% 10 years ago. Now, it should be noted, however, that delinquencies have been coming down since the peak of 12% in 2012. That's the data we're used to hearing, and that's what most of the conversation's about, for good reason. But there are more data and some nuances to the numbers that bear investigating. Because if we're going to reach policy conclusions, and for, for the record, I am not going to reach any policy conclusions because that's not my job, we should dig a little deeper. First and foremost, defaults on smaller loans are actually more common than on big ones. Now, there are a number of reasons that play into this, but there are some trends that emerge. Larger loans tend to be taken on by people attending four-year institutions, like here. And those students tend to complete school at a higher rate. Now, they may have more debt when they graduate, but graduating makes them more likely to find a job and a better paying one at that. So student loans, uh, those students tend to be in better position to repay those loans. Students at for-profit colleges or two-year programs are generally in school for shorter periods of time, which is part of the reason the loans, the amount, is smaller. However, a significant portion of these students are unlikely to finish their degree or certificate, and people who don't complete their programs are more likely to default. This is largely because they struggle to find jobs that pay enough to both repay the loans and cover the general cost of living. That was made exponentially worse by the recession and the attendant weak labor market. In 2013, for instance, the unemployment rate for borrowers who were recent graduates of four-year public and nonprofit institutions was 7.7%, <coughs> only a little higher than the overall average unemployment rate for that year. By contrast, recent graduates of two-year colleges had an unemployment rate of 16.9%. More alarmingly, those who went to for-profit schools had an unemployment rate of 20.6%. Let me put that in context. To put that in perspective, we would literally have to go back to the Great Depression to get a national level of unemployment that high. The recession was also marked by a dramatic increase in attendance at two-year and for-profit colleges. These schools accounted for roughly <coughs> half of the increase in student debt between 2009 and 2011. That increase was part of a longer-term trend that highlights a lot of the data I just talked about. From 2003 to 2013, over 30% of the increase in student debt was taken on by students from those institutions. Being in a better state than your counterparts doesn't lessen the blow of a few decades of paying off loans. I understand that. I get that. And it still has implications for the broader economy. Millennials are now technically a larger generation than the baby boomers, and owing money affects the way they live and participate in the economy. There's a good amount of research that links student debt to younger adults being unable to move out on their own. Some of it finds a big enough effect to impact, for example, the housing market. But we should also look at the way the segmentation of student debt markets impact the way we view the issue, and more broadly, how we approach policy. Fundamentally, this is a question of how we look at skills, the labor force, and the ways in which we prepare people <coughs> for professional success. There is evidence to suggest that by simply offering high school students more intensive, personalized information about college options, they make better, more successful choices. 
Likewise, a more flexible approach to repayment can keep people from winding up in a debt cycle that can permanently affect their credit. At the moment, in this country, student debt holders have the option of programs that protect them from spending more than 10% of their income on repayment. You may have not known that. But they have to reapply annually, filling out the kind of complex set of forms that bureaucracy is famous for. And eligibility is based on the previous year's income, which means that if you lose your job, you won't be off the hook for payments for quite a while. The complexity and probably the frustration of the process keeps a lot of people out of the process who could use that help. Now, one possible solution can be found in our counterparts overseas. Repayments are automatically linked to income through the tax system in countries like Australia, the UK, New Zealand, and others. In addition, in addition to that relief, it gives people paying off student loans. It reduces reams of paperwork. Another issue altogether is thinking about how we address tertiary education on a societal level. You know, when my parents were growing up, all you needed for a good job was a high school diploma. That was still true for some of my generation, but that, that necessity quickly turned into needing a college degree. I bet a lot of you and your friends feel that you won't be competitive in the marketplace without a master's degree, for example. So the bar keeps raising. The thing is, we don't all need or want the same educational track. A traditional four-year degree is great for some people. Ditto a postgraduate degree. For others, it is not necessarily the right path. And we should stop making people feel as though they need, they all need, to fit into the same mold. Changing our approach to how we invest in education and training won't take care of the entire student debt issue, but it can help those who are disproportionately affected by it. Thanks, and let me uh, open it up for questions.